I'd like to welcome all our students here this evening, all our faculty, and particularly a big welcome to Dr. Kevin Coffey, who's going to talk to us about the world of AI and ethics. Um, in relation to questions, please do um, put questions into chat and I'll moderate the chat as we go. And, and Kevin will be delighted to take questions right through his presentation. Um, and I think, as you can all see, the session is recorded. And the recording will be available to everyone on our Graduate Business School Connected Seminar webpage. So please do check it out. And there's also a whole range of other uh, seminars pre-recorded uh, on leadership, uh, digital transformation, sustainability. So you're very welcome, everyone. And over to you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to this. I was I was here last year and uh, I spoke to some of the master's students about this topic and it was a really engaging one and a half, one an hour uh, session. So I think that this is a real topic that it really doesn't lend itself to me just talking for one hour about it. I think this is like these technologies that we um, we're using these technologies every day. And I think even if we might not know it, artificial intelligence systems are interacting with us on lots of applications that we use. So I think it's really important given that there is like this interaction that we have every day with AI, we question whether it is aligned with values that are important to us, like values like fairness, for example. So um, in this session, what I will do is I'll definitely give you an idea of what artificial intelligence is, uh, specifically machine learning, which is really what artificial intelligence is at this point. And once we all have kind of a common understanding of AI, I'll kind of, I'll introduce you to some of the kind of the issues that have raised a lot of ethical concerns over the last few years. So one of the big ones is bias, so that some of these AI systems are biased against specific gender, race, religion. Um, so we'll understand why that's the case, why there is a bias against specific people. Uh, we'll also look at maybe safety, like when these artificial intelligence systems operate in an environment with humans. So let's think like self-driving cars. Are they actually safe? So um, as Ashley said, let's create a session that is somewhat informal. Like I would really appreciate any questions. If you have any comments, that'd be great. So I'll start now. So the main thing that I wanna do is to understand why evaluating technology from an ethical perspective is important. And to survey some of the problems highlighted by the AI fairness community towards artificial intelligence and algorithms. So I don't know, I'm gonna try this video and just see if um, it works. If it doesn't work, it's no problem. Okay. that's. Let's play a game. Sorry, can you guys see that or is that, I'll just play it again. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Is that coming up? Yeah. So Ash, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. good, Kevin, thank you. Okay, so this video is quite informative about how machine learning works. It also raises some of the ethical concerns that we'll talk about, okay. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. Okay, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that, but just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. 
there's interaction bias. Like this recent game, where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool in the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation because technology should work for everyone. So um, let me just go back to my screen. Apologies, okay. Okay, so based on what you just watched, it's clear that training data is at the center of some of the problems related to artificial intelligence. Now I will explain what artificial intelligence is in a few moments, but can anybody tell me, based on what you just watched, when we created facial recognition systems, like early um, examples of facial recognition systems, why some of these systems were not good at recognizing faces with darker skin tones, especially darker skin tone women. Now, Ashley, I suppose we can open it up to people who want to put up their hands or if anybody wants to comment in the chat box, uh, that'd be very welcome. But if anybody has any ideas, why are these computers, why were they not very good at recognizing darker skin tones? Does anybody have any idea? Okay, Cara. Um, yes, Cara, are you able to speak? Sorry, my uh, use of Zoom is not very good. So uh, let me just go back. Apologies. Okay. I have unmuted Cara. Yeah, Cara, do you uh, want to speak? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, please. Great. Um, just one quick flag. I don't think the chat box is working, but the Q&A function is. Um, so just wherever okay. you want to post. But um, I, from the video you've, you've showed, um, Kevin, I'm understanding that it's a bias within the data itself. So what the machine was shown would have biased towards what the output was, right? Exactly. So for you, what kind of... So this, this system was trained on photographs, right? What kind of photographs do you think was were in the training data? The, so if they're recognizing... Like, like what kind of person do you think it was trained on? Like, do you think well, it was white, on? Uh, white, white men, obviously. Exactly. Yeah, there was actually, there was more photos of President George Bush in the database, or in the training model, than there were of black females. So it was just like, it took data from the webs or the, the internet sends. If an AI system does not receive data that is representative of all people, it simply cannot recognize it. I think this is a really key point about AI. AI is completely at the mercy of the training data. It knows nothing beyond it. So when it's looked at you know, a black face, for example, it just simply couldn't recognize it. So like originally, for example, Microsoft's facial recognition data set comprised just 4.4% of dark skinned females. So this is a real problem. And like, you might ask like, why is this a problem? Well, like if we're gonna use these tools, for example, in surveillance, and we see as somebody who's robbed a shop and the facial recognition system has a really high error rates for people with darker skin tones, it's gonna make 
inaccurate readings of who that person is. And it may identify the person in a false way. And that person could be liable to go into prison based on these wrong assumptions and the misuse of these data. So it's a real problem when you have these kind of inaccuracies within the data. Okay, so let's get into our, what is artificial intelligence. Can I ask anybody, does anybody want to just give me an idea of what artificial intelligence is from what they understand? Evan, I know Mark Deegan was trying to get in there, but that was probably on the previous question. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, does anybody want to respond to this question? What do we mean by artificial intelligence? And it doesn't have to be a dictionary definition, it could just be a general description of what it is. Okay, well, maybe we can look at this. Um, as I said before, you're interacting with the AI every single day. So your Spotify algorithm is artificial intelligence. The fact that you have an application that could recommend music to you, it's not somebody in Spotify is like, you know, hey, Kevin, this is a like playlist that you like. That is a computer algorithm. Your social media feed is artificial intelligence. Google Maps is artificial intelligence. Google Home or you know those uh, home devices, that is based on artificial intelligence. So when we think about AI, I think it's really important to not think of it as this because I think in the popular imagination, we, we think of AI as being this kind of future force that's going to, that's going to enslave humanity. What AI is, is it's algorithms that learn from large amounts of data. Okay. And it's computer systems that can replicate aspects of human intelligence. So like visual perception, speech recognition, making decisions and predictions on, on things that you might like. So these systems rely on huge amounts of data and it needs to be good quality data if the AI system is going to be effective. And then based on that training data, and based on an algorithm, which is basically a set of instructions, it can make decisions. And then it can adapt and learn from the outcome of previous decisions. The most kind of common use of AI these days is machine learning. And a good way of looking at machine learning is to divide it into three main approaches of machine learning. So the first one is supervised learning systems, okay? Like how does a computer see? How can it recognize the difference, for example, between a chihuahua, so if you just see up here, uh, and a muffin, okay? How does it know the difference? Well, supervised learning is where you get people who actually work in this job, like they, they're given lots of photographs of things and they label it. So when they see a picture of a chihuahua, they label it a chihuahua. When they see a picture of a muffin, they label it a muffin. And then you give the AI system access to all of this labeled data and you train it to recognize the differences. At the beginning, the AI doesn't know what it's looking at, it knows nothing. But over time, as you give it feedback on whether it's guessing correctly or not, it starts to learn what a muffin looks like compared to a chihuahua, okay? And then you test the model and you see, okay, we're not gonna give it labeled data anymore. We just wanna see, can it recognize the differences between these two things? And over time, generally, it's quite effective at this. Now the Chihuahua or Muffin example is a bit silly, but this has real world application for things like recognizing tumors. So we give it labeled data on like, what's a tumor and what's not a tumor. And over time, it can recognize the differences. It can be more accurate and obviously quicker than radiologists. There's another, machine learning approach, which be like, how does AI recognize language, okay? Now, initially AI was like, the initial approach to AI and understanding language was like, let's just give the computer rules on syntax and grammar, but that's really time consuming. It's not particularly effective. So instead what we do is we give all of the textual data, or as much as the textual data as possible to an algorithm. And then the AI system begins to recognize patterns in languages. 
Okay. So for instance, like if we give an AI system lots of language and we want to make a prediction about what word would go after familiar. So like I am familiar, and then it makes an estimate on the probability that the next word is going to be with, I'm familiar with. So it starts to recognize like the proximity of words that usually go together and it's based on probability and it's been really, really effective. So unsupervised learning system is just basically when we give it the system lots of data, we don't necessarily give the AI system an objective. We're just like find patterns in the data and classify that data and put it into clusters. Now we'll talk about bias a little bit more um, but I can kind of signpost something that I will talk about, which is even though this application is really effective, that idea of like proximity of words together has created biases. For instance, in the AI system, we learned that the word doctor was associated with man and the word nurse was associated with women. So there is, the AI system is not biased within itself, but it's picking up on our own societal biases that when it examines the textual data, you can see that there were certain occupations that just were very gender specific. Like you can see on the left-hand side of that box, women were associated with nurses, librarians, nannies, stylists, dancers. And for men, which you can see on the right-hand side, the association was architect, captain, philosopher, legend, and hero. So supervised is give the AI system lots of data and it just recognizes patterns. The final one is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is much like the way that you would train a dog, okay? So you give the AI system objective or you give the dog objective. So like stand on your two legs. Um, with an AI, we could say win a game of chess. And then you consistently give either the dog or the AI system feedback. And the feedback is a reward or punishment. So when the dog doesn't do, like, listen to your instructions about standing on your feet, I don't know, you don't give it a treat. When it does stand on its two feet, uh, you give it a treat. And the same thing with teaching an AI system to win a game of chess. If, you, if the AI system makes a move that increases the probability of winning the game based on past historical data, then you reward it. And then you keep repeating this until the AI system masters the game or you repeat it until the dog gets down on two feet based on the instruction you give it. Now, reinforcement learning is often used for things like self-driving uh, cars. Um, so for instance, if you don't necessarily want to train a car to learn every single rule in a human environment, but instead what you want to do is a more kind of dynamic way of learning, which is like anytime you go on the wrong side of the road, that is punished. Okay. And a punishment is basically you're getting further away from the mathematical objective. And anytime you stop at a green light, you give it a reward. And over time, the AI system can learn to more safely drive in the road. Can I ask you guys, um, this might be a strange question to ask, but it kind of helps with understanding reinforcement learning. Um, firstly, you guys may be too young to <laughs> like play this game. I played this game in the 1980s with my brother. Um, AI is really useful for learning to play games and I'll explain why that has an ethical dimension later. But, um, with this, if we were to train an AI system to play Mario, the way that we would use reinforcement learning is like, the AI system has no idea how to play Mario at the beginning. Like it's gonna be moving left, it'll be going into those you know, dangerous, um, you know, are they kind of mushrooms? I don't know exactly what they are, but it will learn over time what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. So randomly it might jump up onto the platform and get a mushroom. And suddenly over time through playing this game over and over, it realizes actually getting a mushroom means that you can survive for longer. So the AI system will generally through just random actions, just find what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do because you've given it the objective of finishing the game. So that's how it works. Now, the ethical dimension of this is AI is really good at playing games because AI is really suited to 
environments that are really well defined, that have clear, consistent rules. And games do have that. But if you put it into a very dynamic, unpredictable environment, such as a city with busy traffic, or if you put it into a battlefield context, where it encounters lots of new inputs and variables that it's never been trained on, it's very difficult for an AI system to operate in a safe way. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Okay, one thing I'll just add to our understanding of artificial intelligence is we've spoken about the different aspects of machine learning and like how an AI system can learn to play a game, how is an AI system can learn how to see something and recognize an object and how it can understand language. But it's also important to just think of this as not like some disembodied abstract computation. AI has a physical in infrastructure, okay? It involves some important ethical considerations such as environmental considerations. To enable cloud computing, which AI relies on, we have to extract rare earth minerals, such as lithium, for example. And that has a huge environmental toll, especially in the communities where this mining is taking place. Another environmental consideration is to train these AI models, we require huge amounts of energy in these data centers. It is one of the greatest consumers of electricity uh, of any industry. And finally, for AI to learn how to recognize objects, for example, it requires human labor, such as like data labelers. And often the people who work in these jobs are very low paid with insecure work. Kevin, we have a question from Kiron, and Kiron was asking in reinforcement learning, can you clarify how an AI system can recognize award reward? Yeah, so like a human engineer, or engineer, like my background is ethics, so my understanding of the engineering of this is fairly limited. But as far as I know, it's really about the mathematical function or the objective of the AI system. And the engineer would program it to reach a particular objective. And if it is moving away from that objective, it would be, it would be within the, the kind of the algorithm itself to say that you're actually moving further away from the objective. And the reward is you're getting closer to the objective. Okay, um, so let's just speak about the ethics um, or introduce the idea of ethics into this conversation. So when we talk about ethics, in general, we're just speaking about like how to live a good life, our rights and responsibilities, the language of right and wrong, moral decisions, like what is good and what is bad. I suppose a good way of thinking about ethics is let's just stop relying on our intuitions to make judgments on what is right and what is wrong. It's asking us to have a framework for thinking about the issues of what is right and what is wrong. Because as humans, we're kind of flawed. Like if I'm thinking about you know, what's happening in Qatar at the moment where this issue with the, um, the armbands that is in support of the LGBTQ community, like intuitively, like I have an identity that is fairly progressive, okay? And I will then retroactively try to justify that position based on my intuitions, which I think, I just think that's wrong. Ethics is asking us to step outside of ourselves and just think about these issues in a way that is depersonalized, but has a particular framework for understanding what is right and what is wrong. And there's different frameworks for making these considerations. Like utilitarianism is really about this, this idea that human beings are motivated by the pursuit of pleasure and trying to minimize pain. So given that assumption, the right thing to do is to try and perform actions that maximize well-being, okay? Just do whatever makes the most amount of people happy in the aggregates. And even if that leads to some risks or some dangers, if the consequence leads to what we call the greater good, let's go for it. So with 
AI, it's this idea of like, AI doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be like ethically pure. It just means that we need to think about the trade-offs involved in AI. And if like ultimately there's more benefits and risks, then we should just enable it and facilitate it. Deontology is a bit different, which is like, it's not about thinking about it from a consequentialist point of view and like thinking about happiness. It's more that we should have strict rules in place that respect the rights and dignity of the user. That has tremendous implications for things like big data and the violation of our privacy, okay? I think egalitarianism is perhaps the most important theory for critiquing AI because big data and artificial intelligence systems unfortunately have amplified discrimination and inequality in many cases. And that returns to the idea of bias, that if these AI systems are being trained on biases within the data that basically capture historical prejudices. I'll speak a little bit later about um, that some of these systems are biased against particular races. So for instance, there was this AI system that was called Compass, and it was a, it made a prediction about whether a person, if they were released from prison, would they commit crimes again? Like, what was the probability that a person would commit crimes if they were released early from prison? And once they used this AI system, they found that um, African Americans were mistaken as high risk at twice the rates of white Americans. Now the question is like, why is that happening? Why is the AI system saying that African-Americans are twice as likely to commit a crime in the future than white Americans? And the problem was within the data because in America, African-American communities are over-policed. Like if I'm a white person walking around to my white neighborhood in America and I have drugs on me, it's much more unlikely that I will be stopped by the police. But if I'm, Black and I'm in a community that has a heavy police presence is much more likely that I would be stopped and caught with drugs than if I was white. And therefore within the data, remember the AI system only knows the data that it's fed. Within the data, it's clear that, okay, African-Americans are um, arrested more than white people. African-Americans are sentenced to higher um, or stronger prison sentences than white people. And therefore, that's how the AI system like captures that bias. And that's why it thinks that African Americans are twice as likely to make crimes than white Americans. There's also Aristotle's virtue ethics. And I think this is a really useful theory for thinking about the dangers of algorithms in social media. Because Aristotle's virtue ethics is like, we should try and create a society that enables people to live the good life. And the good life is where we try to become better citizens. And we become better citizens through cultivating virtues such as honesty, uh, humility, courage, temperament, self-control. And when we look at the objective of social media platforms, let's think of like TikTok, Instagram, and so forth. YouTube would also be another one. The idea is, or the objective is user engagement. How can we get you to stay on the platform for as long as possible? Now, from an engineering point of view, I mean, that makes sense. Like you're, you're focused on optimization. The optimization is we want you to stay on the platform for as long as possible. And we understand specific tools and techniques to make you stay on the platform. Like these systems are designed with the same designs of Las Vegas, Las Vegas casinos. Like, you know, when you pull a slot machine, there's a variable reward that keeps us hooked. Um, you know, so there's lots of tools that these social media companies use. And when you think about that, is it actually leading us to live a better life? Like, is it cultivating good virtues or is it cultivating vices? So um, when we think about the ethics of these algorithms, I think it is important to include an ethical assessment of these technologies that we don't just simply think about it from an engineering point of view, but there's considerations of like, who is this going to harm? Like, let's identify the stakeholders. Is there any way that we could harm those stakeholders? Um, 
looking beyond the ob objective of optimization, can this objective lead to any unintended consequences that we can think of? Um, does it actually violate anybody's rights? How transparent can we make this model so people actually understand that the, the end user of these technologies, they can actually understand how their data is being used or how the algorithm makes decisions that impacts on them. So it's widening the lens to take into consideration things that might lead to blind spots within the engineering of these technologies. Like an example of this would be um, when seat belts were first designed, okay, women were much more likely to be seriously injured or killed in a car accident than men. Does anybody know why women were much more likely to be seriously injured or killed than men? Does anybody have their hand up? Yeah. Uh, Kara, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I can't hear you. I was hoping someone else would put up the hand section with the answer to this, but it's because most crash test dummies were men. Exactly. Yeah. That gives you an idea of like why it's important to widen perspectives about engineering decisions and product decisions. You know, like in having a more diverse team of people designing products, it's not just simply about, you know, diversity for the sake of diversity. It's about widening the perspective of what are the potential problems with this product? So as Kara said, like the reason is, is that the seatbelts were designed by men and when they, you know, designed the crash test dummy, it had the male form, it didn't have the female form. So it was designed to protect the, the male body form. Now, if there are women in that design team, they probably would have put their hand up and be like, listen, there's an issue here that we actually have to, you know, create one that's, you know, female form as well. So I think like beyond the engineering and the optimization of this performance task, what are some other issues that we need to look at? Let's look at it from multiple angles and let's consider the ethics of this product. Okay. All right, so I think I'll just go, yeah, okay. Sorry, I've been speaking for ages. Um, does anybody have any thoughts, any comments, any questions? Okay. So we've prompted people to put some uh, comments in chat there, Kevin, as they, they come up as well, just so you're aware of that. Okay, that's good. Okay, brilliant. That's good. Okay. Sorry, I am just not very good at using Zoom. Apologies for this. Okay. Okay, I've really spoken about some of the risk of AI at this point. Um, I do really want to include in this presentation just some of the real opportunities that AI brings. So what AI is extremely good at is finding signal in the data, okay? Um, remember when I spoke about unsupervised learning, that you simply just like feed an AI system lots of data and then the, the AI system can recognize patterns within the data. And we don't necessarily tell the AI system like what patterns to look for, it just finds itself. That's tremendously important. Um, if you think about like AI in healthcare, for example, Okay, so like AI works really well in healthcare because there's large volumes of fairly high quality data, especially compared to other industries. Now, one key part of medical research is drug discovery for viruses and antibiotic resistant bacteria. Now, generally, this is really expensive and time consuming for humans to conduct. But what an AI can, model can do is that we can feed an AI system like thousands of molecules and approved drugs and natural products for, let's say a bacteria or a virus that we don't necessarily have effective treatment for. So we feed it all of that data 
And then the AI system can survey those the thousands or maybe even millions of data points and see whether there's a correlation between this particular treatments and this particular virus. And that can be like often like human researchers do not have that capability to kind of see the signal within the noise. So AI can be in tr tremendously uh, important for, um, you know, finding signal within noise. And like, you know, if we have really good quality data, hopefully AI can really help us with some huge challenges that we face in the future, such as like increased access to water, the most effective way to deal with climate change. But there are risks that I'll get into now, okay? Kevin, we have a, a question from Cara just in relation to risks. Um, and yeah. her question is beyond the use of ethical frameworks, are there any governing bodies or regulation emerging for AI? Yeah, I think um, the European Union has been fairly active in this regard. Uh, one example of this is GDPR. Uh, so having some kind of digital legal framework that brings in especially deontological ethics, which is we need to treat the end user with dignity and the end user of these technologies must have, or they must have their individual rights respected. So at the European level, yes, um, there's other emerging blocks like kind of AI superpowers. In America, it is much more libertarian. It's much more like, so long as the end user of these technologies can sense to them, the users are fair game. In China, there's not much use of regulations. Uh, in fact, China is using artificial intelligence as a surveillance tool to monitor their citizens. Um, and it's kind of a means of social control. But at the European level, yes, there is uh, digital frameworks to, uh, that are based on these ethical frameworks to uh, ensure that these tech companies do align the design of these systems with ethical principles. Thank you, Kara. Okay, let's get into the problem of bias a little bit further. I'll give you some examples just so that it's very clear to you what are some of the problems associated with these systems. Okay, I spoke earlier about the deployments of AI within criminal justice. Now within criminal justice, it's really about ensuring that people are treated equitably, that punishment is not on the basis of characteristics that you cannot change. As I said before, there's a racial bias in the justice system where it, they had this risk assessment tool that made predictions about who's going to commit crimes in the future. And as I said before, because of existing societal biases within the criminal justice system in America, the AI system learned from that data. And uh, the COMPASS system, which is an AI tool, uh, deemed African-Americans to be more likely to commit crimes than their white counterparts. The racial bias also exists within algorithms that use uh, that are used in the healthcare industry. So there was an AI system that was built to make predictions on who should receive advanced healthcare. And this is a way like to overcome the problem that it's just time consuming for humans to do this. So the model used the proxy uh, to kind of make this much faster and more efficient. It used the proxy of how much a patient spent on past healthcare to identify future healthcare needs. This was not a good proxy because basically the proxy captured the fact that white Americans tend to spend more on healthcare than black. So what happened was there was a racial disparity within access to healthcare. The model privileged white Americans uh, for access to healthcare over black Americans. So the algorithm falsely concluded that because some black Americans weren't accessing the healthcare system, that they were healthier than their white counterparts. But it was just simply the kind of systemic problems within the healthcare industry within America. There's also gender bias within AI. And if you guys want to know more about this, there's a really good documentary on Netflix called Coded Bias. Um, there's a good example of this in that documentary where Amazon 
built an AI model that was designed to recruit people. Again, like recruitment is really expensive. It's time consuming. So they wanted to just make this process more efficient. Now the AI job recruitment tool that Amazon used was trained on historical data. Again, it captured a bias because historically Amazon hired white men and the AI system, even like if you didn't include that bias as a specific attributes, like you remove gender from that algorithm, it still captured the bias because there's all sorts of inferences that we can make in terms of whether you're a male or a female, like what sports or hobbies that you have that you include in your CV, even your language. So the machine learning algorithm was capturing the fact that previously successful applicants used this type of language, had this type of hobby, had, you know, went to this university that may have been mostly occupied by white men. And female candidates were overlooked by the AI system. So it was learning from existing biases. As I said before, it's also captured in language where you, know, you feed textual data to an AI system and it captures these um, associations that are very gender specific and capture kind of a generalization or a stereotype that is not necessarily true. For instance, women are nurses, men are doctors. There's a really interesting tool called Dali Mini. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's, it's been pretty popular on social media, but it's kind of an amazing tool. Like if you type in anything into this description, okay, it will create art based on that prompt. So you could like say Cristiano Ronaldo walking hand in hand with Lionel Messi and the sun is setting. It will recreate that image and it won't be perfect, but it's not bad. But there's biases within this as well, because if you type in doctor into it, it's gonna come up with male doctors. If you type in nurse, because it's based on images from the internet, um, it's gonna come up with nurses. Like it gets even darker. I mean, if you're going to put in the word sexy, it is just women. Um, so the associations and the stereotypes that exist within our own society are captured within the AI. Debiasing these systems is quite difficult. So you actually have to go into the data and try your best to remove some of the attributes that are leading to these biases. But as I said, there's many ways that an AI system can make inferences on whether you're black or white, whether you're gay or straight, whether you are a woman or a man. So it's just a very difficult process to try and debias these systems. From Kieran in chat, um, and Kieran, do jump in if I'm not representing your question uh, correctly. So Kieran is asking, how is um, AI different from pharma, where pharma is trying to manage the conditions uh, and the risks rather than really trying to solve problems and solve issues um, around ethics? Okay, can you just repeat that one more time? Yeah, actually, Kieran, would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah, I don't mind. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So I think uh, my point is that uh, at the point of departure on an artificial intelligence action, um, and the example I used was, you know, in, in medicine or pharma, there's mm. there's a lot of commercialization that goes with managing a problem rather than actually solving a problem. And there's a lot of money to be made by managing the problem rather than solving it. So that point of departure where we introduce AI and we begin the AI journey is to you know, rather than saying we want to manage something, surely we should be saying, can the AI find a solution for us? Mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't, then are we being unethical at the at the outset? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, if we really truly want to approach this from an ethical point of view, we need to, from the very beginning, include ethics within all of the steps of the design process. Like there's different approaches like value sensitive design, um, ensuring that we also include people from non-engineering backgrounds in the design process of these technologies so that when the design of these technologies is happening, that we include 
consultations with ethicists, sociologists, lawyers, and so forth in other expert domains. Because I think one of the problems with artificial intelligence is that, and rightfully so, like engineers just don't have the expertise to solve these problems. Like when we think about the, the kind of gender with it, the gender bias within language, that's more of a, like a sociological question. And this is not something that engineers themselves can actually resolve themselves. So increasingly, we are seeing kind of an AI fairness community building up where, you know, people who take, or engineers who take artificial intelligence and ethics very seriously are engaging with academics, as I said, sociologists, human rights lawyers, and so forth. And that helps in terms of addressing some of the blind spots that naturally arise when it, this is just purely an engineering decision. Okay, I'm not sure if that answers your question. If do you want to follow up with that? No, oh, thank, thanks, Kevin. I don't want to don't want to hog the session. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you for the question. Okay, uh, some other issues that I'll just quickly get into is privacy. As you know, artificial intelligence is completely at the mercy of the data that it's, uh, that, that it's fed on. And for that reason, big data is a huge issue with these AI systems, especially within social media. Um, now, one thing to just bear in mind that, that when you're on the internet, uh, you basically have a digital shadow. That's your data is sold to data brokers. And the data broker's job is to find out who you are. Now, they'll be collecting lots of different types of data on you. Uh, for instance, let's say you are a company that wants to sell products to pregnant women, okay? Now, in many cases, there's no, no kind of explicit identifier online to say that you are pregnant. But what it can do is, capture data that makes an inference that you are pregnant. For instance, if you buy folic acid um, online or if you buy a product for stretch marks, that's the data broker will then identify you or classify you as a person with a high probability of being pregnant. You will then be served advertisements um, for products that, for pregnant women. And well, you might say, okay, that's a fairly innocuous issue, but let's say you had a miscarriage and suddenly you're just being fed with these advertisements. In one way, it's creepy that they know this, but also it's like, if we think about that ethical idea of minimizing suffering, that's going to be, that's going to really compound suffering at a very traumatic point in your life. There was also a case that um, they can make inferences about your political views and sexual orientation. Uh, there was a person who had not come out, so she was a lesbian, and you know she was sitting beside a friend, and she was on her computer, and she was just being like, there was lots of personalized advertisements for like gay cruises. So her friends naturally understood that you know she was a lesbian. Now she didn't like that's a way of that's fairly unethical because she didn't consent to coming out that way, and I think this is some of the creepy elements of AI, but also the very unethical uh, use of our personal data in ways that we don't understand um, and that we haven't necessarily consented to. So before I mentioned about social media algorithms and the danger where we have an objective that is about engagements, but we don't necessarily think through the implications of an algorithm that's based on that objective. This can lead to, as we know, all sorts of problems such as creating filter bubbles. So we click on what we like, it feeds us more information based on what we like rather than information that is necessarily true or that's been verified and so forth. Also, it's a human instinct to click on information that is sensational and outraged. So the preference model pushes up information that is sensational and that causes outrage. Also, fast personalized information is not necessarily good for critical thinking. Like we're not able to effectively evaluate information in a fast personalized way. It doesn't help us like slowly deliberate over the information that we are consuming. And this is an environment like 
an algorithm that is based on engagements facilitates an online environment that is really susceptible to disinformation, you know, that creates these filter bubbles. There's so much information out there that kind of bad faith actors can collect individual pieces of information and build a narrative that, that is not truly representative of the society that we live in. Kevin, we have uh, two or three questions coming in here. Uh, one oh, from Aaron. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what's your opinion on ethics of developing or attempting to develop an AI that can independently think or have feelings and emotions, robot ethics or human simulations? And Aaron, feel free to come in um, and elaborate. Okay, really good question. That's a question that is important. Um, but honestly, the the ethics of AI has been very much based on narrow AI because that's the AI that we have at the moment. Narrow AI is like AI that can perform single tasks, like play chess, make a prediction of who's going to commit a crime in the future. That question is more about general AI, like AI that can just do many different things and that has the ability to replicate human consciousness. Now, that's something that is kind of far off in the future but it's something that we need to consider. But it really comes down to our definition of what it means to be human, what it means to have human consciousness. Um, can AI ever be a sentient being? Remember what AI is though, like it's code, it's training data. Um, now there's a lot of you know, tech people who believe that in the future, we will get this kind of, human-like artificial intelligence, but still really far in the distant future. Now, if it can replicate some of the aspects that make us human, I think then yes, I mean, we should have digital rights for um, what will be sentient beings. So thank you for the question. And one more um, yeah. from Mark Deegan. Do we have a specific issue relating to reproducing bias and gendered stereotypes when training models on gendered language or languages? Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult process because as I said before, you can remove these specific attributes that are causing the bias. Like, you know, you could remove data that refers to women as nurses. It's so difficult though to actually fully de-bias a data sets because essentially, as I said, the AI will pick up on inferences of gender that we just haven't identified ourselves. As I said before, you know, women and men use language differently. The AI, given enough data, will pick up on that bias or pick up on the way that we use language differently. So it might be better to simply not remove the attributes that are causing the bias, but simply when we see the output data, we're like, there is a clear gender or racial bias here that we just simply acknowledge that the bias is there and not necessarily agree fully with what the AI is predicting or making a decision on. It's just, we can use it as a tool to kind of help us make decisions, but we acknowledge the fact that there is an existing bias in there. And you know, that's a more transparent process where we just like in the output data, it's clear there's a bias. Thank you, Kevin. And just to say to the group, we're three minutes towards the end. So if anyone has any questions, please do put them forward. Thank you. Okay, I'll have time to just speak about one more thing. I, there's one more point that I think is very important. Okay. Um, this refers to the fact that, especially like tech utopians, there's this impulse to try and make everything computational computationally legible. This idea that technology is always the solution to a problem. Now, one example of this is there is a tool that makes predictions about your inner emotions based on your facial expressions. So for instance, if we were to try and make a prediction about what this person in the top left-hand corner is, we could say, okay, she's happy. This is really based on dubious science and there actually is application of these facial recognition tools that are used in job interviews, used in airports to see that person is 
uh, a potential terrorist, for example. So there is real world applications that try and capture this idea that an AI system can read people's emotions. Now, this is an example of how we shouldn't use technology for resolving all sorts of problems. Like we need to think about the quality of the data. Now the quality of the data for this was really, really poor. Like the science behind it was really poor because essentially it was trained on a system where a researcher was saying to an actor, hey, can you pull a face that is happy? Can you pull, pull a face that is surprised? And then the system was trained on the simulated expression that the actor pulled in response to cues that the researcher was asking. Now, if we apply this type of technology where a company is using it in interviews, it might discriminate against people who are not replicating the micro expressions that the AI tool wants you to have. And I think that's quite dangerous. And it's also dangerous because, you know, human expression is not universal. Like the way that people uh, have facial expressions across the world is expressing different emotional points of view. And it's trying to impose a particular view of what emotion, like emotional cues match with uh, facial expressions that are potentially quite discriminatory against different types of people. So I think one thing just to take into consideration as a final point is that if the data is poor, if the data is not capturing the reality that you're trying to measure, these AI tools are potentially quite dangerous and potentially also very ineffective. Okay, I think that's pretty much what we have time for. Um, does anybody want to ask any final questions? Any additional questions, uh, yeah. Kevin? But first of all, to thank you so much for sharing your expertise this evening and to all of the participants. Um, really important point, those of you who are involved in digital leadership, I think Kevin has left us with a very strong message in ensuring that we have ethical frameworks, but also that we are hiring diverse teams uh, for those who are involved and in working on AI. Uh, anyone who wants to pick up the recording of this or any of our other recordings from our Connected Seminar series, do visit our TU Dublin Graduate Business School. And in our Connected Seminar series, you'll see um, a whole range of recordings from this evening and uh, previous seminar evenings as well. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much, everyone. And um, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise. No, thank you for the invitation. Really appreciate it. Good. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.